One of the things I do, apart from uh, political journalism, I write columns and do stuff for the BBC, is I go around touring the country. I'm a bit like Bob Dylan on a never-ending tour, um, except for not quite so wealthy or well-known or legendary. But apart from that, we're very similar. Um, and I do this tour with a, a, a show called Rock and Roll Politics. It's a metaphor for politics being all shook up. And the reason I do it is this weird theory I've got that politics is more interesting than it seems. Now, I've got a lot of friends who tell me quite openly, I don't know how you cope, Steve, it's so boring, they're all the bloody same, they're all the same. And I say, I think it's really interesting. And they look at me as if I'm off my head. But here is why I think it's interesting. Politics is full of people, human beings, facing nightmarish dilemmas day in, day out. And when you recognize the kind of dilemmas they face, politics becomes partly a thriller, partly a moral escapade, partly something that touches us all. I remember seeing Blair. Blair, when he became prime minister in 1997, used to invite columnists in to see him about once every 10 minutes. He was obsessed with the media. <laughs> Um, and I went to see him, it was about the summer of 1997, he was about 50 points ahead in the polls, you know, it was that period when he walked on water. And at the end, I knew him quite well in opposition, at the end, I said to him over this coffee, just out of interest, uh, Tony, what, what is it like being Prime Minister? What is the human experience of being Prime Minister? And Blair was sort of getting up, you know, huh? interesting I've never thought about it, actually lie um, and then and then he said yeah I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you what the difference is I find that about every hour I have to face and make a decision and the decision comes down to do I slip my wrist or cut my throat um, and then he paused and said I quite like it actually um, <laughs> but what he was saying is all the time he faced decisions where there was no easy win. And in that mindset, by the way, haven't got time to go into it today, you start to explain the tour he took to the nightmare called Iraq. But that's what makes it interesting. Even in an era where there isn't much charisma around, you can't help but be interested because of these human dilemmas. Take two current examples. Ed Miliband. He has been much mocked and vilified for having that photograph. You know the photo I'm referring to with the Sun newspaper backing England in the World Cup? Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, anyway, those of you who don't, Miliband last Friday was photographed holding aloft the Sun, backing our boys in the World Cup. People said, what a disaster, he's anti-Murdoch, he's anti-the Sun, he's condemned the Sun in the past, what's he doing? This is like Ian Duncan Smith at his worst. He's lost it. But just think about it for a second. If he had refused the request to back our boys as they approached the World Cup, imagine what would have happened to him. Geek refuses to back our boys. Unpatriotic Ed Miliband refused. So he would have been in agonies about this wretched photo. What do I do if I don't do it? And as a result, you get into a complete mess. He apologised for the photo having taken it, the worst of all worlds. But the alternative was also a trap. And the same with Cameron today. He's in a European summit. He's going to try and veto unsuccessfully the next president of the European Union. And a lot of people have said that the big mistake Cameron has made has been to do this noisily as if an option available to him would be to sort of whisper quietly, do you mind if you veto the EU president? The moment you set out on this course, and incidentally he had no choice but to set out on this course, because his party would have crucified him if he didn't, you have no choice but to do it noisily. You can't whisper to Merkel, do you mind very softly if we wreck the entire plans of the European Parliament and all of you, and veto? You have to do it noisily. But he's been condemned. And he would have been condemned if he hadn't tried to do it. He was trapped. But we journalists do not see the dilemmas. We assume they are mighty and strong. And in the gap between the two, tragedy and comedy collide in a kind of Shakespearean way. It's what I explore in my full show.
But what has to happen as a result of this collision is these nervous leaders have to become inauthentic. They have to pretend that they are what they are not. To give one example, Cameron and Osborne are posh. It's not their fault that they are posh, they are posh. They were born <laughs> posh. But in modern Britain, you're not allowed to be posh. It's a big change. Macmillan used to show off about how posh he was. So the biggest crisis Cameron and Osborne has faced in this parliament was whether or not they'd ever eaten a Cornish pasty. <laughs> you may remember Osborne, in his, one of his budgets, put the tax up on Cornish pasties. It was a weird, comic moment. This is going to be an historic tax reforming budget. Pause. I'm putting a penny on Cornish pasties. You thought, what? <laughs> History in the making. But from that moment, the burning question in British politics was, had Cameron or Osborne ever eaten a Cornish pasty? <laughs> in Cornwall, they were saying, I bet those posh bastards have never eaten a Cornish pasty. <laughs> Miliband and Balls were filmed in Greg's. <laughs> Miliband looked as if he had never been in Greg's in his life. I can't think why. Balls looked entirely at ease and ate two Cornish pasties on the spot. <laughs> but... Cameron and Osborne didn't know how to deal with the question, not because there wasn't an answer, there was. I bet they've never eaten them. But the symbolism was dangerous. It would show that they were too posh to have eaten a Cornish pasty. So Osborne disappeared for months, didn't appear in front of the media. <laughs> Cameron had no such option as a Prime Minister. And the next time he appeared in public while this question was raging was a joint press conference with the Italian Prime Minister in the midst of the Euro crisis in number 10. And they walked out to the podium together for this joint press conference. Cameron talked for five minutes on the euro, the Italian prime minister five minutes for the euro. And then Cameron said, right, any questions from, yeah, Nick Robinson, BBC. Prime Minister, have you ever eaten a Cornish pasty? <laughs> well, at that point, the Italian prime minister has a heart attack because he doesn't even know what a Cornish pasty is <laughs> and whether he's meant to have eaten it. And Cameron, you might have remembered, said, well, what a question, Nick, but since you've asked, I thoroughly enjoyed a Cornish pasty at Leeds railway station. This was the planned answer that they'd spent about three weeks preparing. <laughs> Cameron went back to his office, sat down with all his advisors, and said, thank God we got the Cornish pasty question out of the way. And then he looked up at the rolling news television screen, the modern tyranny for leaders. And there was Adam Bolton from Sky News, who looked as if he had eaten about eight Cornish pasties that day, <laughs> talking about the pasty crisis. And underneath was the strap line, breaking news, a spokesman for Leeds Railway Station has said that the Cornish pasty shop closed nine years ago. <laughs> Cameron could not have eaten a Cornish pasty. Huge crisis. I get a call from Newsnight. Will you come on and talk about the future of the coalition? And on it goes. Now, the reason why someone who is quite a skilled politician, whatever you think of him, got into such a mess over a Cornish pasty is because he could not be what he is. Similarly with Ed Miliband, when you see him speak in public, he tries to be like Tony Blair because he hasn't got a confident public voice. I saw him speak once, he does that white shirt wandering around the stage and he said last time I saw him like Blair, I'll tell you what's wrong with this country, it's got good people and a bad government. I want to achieve the reverse. You think, what? <laughs> You can't be what you are not. But because we, the media, and perhaps all of us, do not accept that they have these dilemmas, they cannot tell us they have these dilemmas. They cannot go on the state programme and say, well, actually, I feel really in a bind about this. I'm not quite sure what to do. That would be authentic, but they opt for inauthenticity instead. And in that is a treasure trove of tragic, comic and significant material. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>